Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros. This is where we put the fun into business fundamentals. My guest on this edition of the Humorology Podcast is an award-winning comedian who is, according to the independent newspaper, ranked among the top 10 stand-ups in Britain. From his debut on stage at the Edinburgh Festival in 1996, to his appearances on programmes like The Eleven O'Clock Show, Never Mind the Buzzcocks and Mock the Week, he has built a career on spreading laughter. He has since hosted comedy sports shows like Off the Ball, The Football's On, and co-presented the award-winning Rock and Roll Football on Absolute Radio with the legendary Ian Wright. Also known as The Company Man, he is now a regular contributor for Arsenal magazine. And since 2019, he's presented Handbrake Off, the very popular Arsenal podcast. While I'm sure he'd rather be at the Emirates, we are very happy he could join us for a chat. Ian Stone, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Hello, Paul. Thanks for having me. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's it's an absolute pleasure to see you. And it was lovely to uh, hear your stories about going with my good friend Ainsley to the Champions League just as we yeah. before we came on. Yeah, I, I mean, a sad ending to that game. But, um, you know, a Champions League final in Paris against Barcelona is really, that's as good as it gets, unless you win it, obviously. <laughs> well, there's going to be time for that, hopefully. There is. Now, I know you and I know you grew up in a Jewish working class family in North London during the mid 70s. But what I don't know is much about your family and was humour valued in it? <laughs> well, um, no, not really. To be honest with you, that there, there was there, there, my, my parents didn't like each other. I mean, well, actually, no, I can. Shall I rephrase that? My parents absolutely hated each other. And so there wasn't a lot of humor in my house, to be honest with you. Um, it wasn't. No, I don't remember. I mean, to be honest, I, I have I have very strong recollections of, of laughing once or twice in my house as a kid. And that was both times with my dad watching Billy Connolly or Michael Parkinson. And that oh. was pretty much the only time, really. It wasn't a lot of laughs at home. Well, it, it's interesting because obviously we know so many comedians um, uh, and, and so many, including me and Ainsley, come from uh, broken backgrounds or broken yeah. homes, if you like. Um, do you think that is kind of a, a driver for us to get sort of love from somewhere else, you know, if you like? I think I think there is something in that. I, I mean, I, I don't really go along with the idea of the sad clown. I'm no. not sad. I mean, there are sad moments, but I'm not sad. I'm pretty happy, really. I get to talk nonsense for a living about football and about anything I want, really, in front of people. It's absolutely brilliant. But in terms of um, trying to fill the uh, the aching void <laughs> from the neglect I got from my parents, yes. Every evening, the adulation of strangers is absolutely, um, is really, is so important to me. So um, I think there is something in that, really. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, I agree. And Ainsley and I have had this discussion that, that I mean, both our, our, our parents actually split at pretty much the same time. And uh, I mean, doing what I do now in psychology, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to analyse what what are we doing? Is that was that need for adulation always there? And would you call it like a show off gene? I don't think it's really a show off gene. It's more of a like me gene, to be honest with okay. you. You know, if you're not getting if you're not getting a lot of love at home, and it's not that I wasn't I was provided with the basics. I was fed. There was a roof over my head, but they were so busy hating on each other. They didn't really have time for me. I think so. And I don't wish to appear harsh, but I would say that I wrote a book about growing up in the 1970s called To Be Someone. And in that book, I called my father the single, the single most useless adult human I've ever met in my life. And he read the book. And just to give you an idea of the sort of person he is, I phoned him up and I said, have you read the book? He said, yeah, yeah, I've read the book. He goes, I loved it. And I went, really? I said, what about the bit where I called you the single most useless adult human I've ever met in my life? He went, oh, I didn't mind that. Because it's true. <laughs> so that, that is what he was like. And 
him and my mother did not have a good relationship and I sort of retreated to my room really. So listen to music, listen to the jam. And then when I was out and watching Arsenal. So when I finally started doing stand up, and I, I genuinely love standing on stage and I, and I think it is, it is really like me. Although at this point I'm not as bothered by the please like me thing because I'm quite a few years in, but you know, certainly for the first few years, there was a certain, Hey, Hey, it's me. I'm, I hope you don't mind. So not, not, I'm not like that now. Well, yeah, but I think, I mean, at the core, I think most um, performers are are like that. I mean, you kind of talked about it as a coping mechanism. Um, what did that coping mechanism kick in at school as well? And and what part did that humour play in gaining confidence and and getting friends? Um, well, I think I was funny at school. I used to like making people laugh. I definitely got a buzz out of it. Um, not just at school, through my early teenage years as well. I remember I remember so vividly being at a party once and someone asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to be a pilot. That's what I said. And they said to me, I jokingly, I heard you were going to work for the gas board. And I said, yeah, I was going to be a gas pilot. Right. And I remember instantly, I remember everyone laughing so much. And I remember thinking, oh, hello, this is, this is nice. And even women that I was interested in, were laughing and I thought well this this might work for me plus I obviously had this face as well which I've grown into but certainly did not work in my teenage years so I think for all those reasons yeah I wanted to make people laugh because it was something that I could do and my head is my head appears to be wired that way well it is interesting isn't it that that there is a wiring you know because I I I sometimes ask people on the show can anybody uh, be funny? And most comics hear from a very early age where the laugh is, you just talked about uh, the gas pilot gag. And that's, you hear things in a certain way and you, the wiring, as you say, is in a certain way. Were you, were you a shy kid who discovered that or were you quite confident already? No, I was a shy kid. I didn't, like I say, I used to get quite a lot of stick about my nose and I wasn't very happy about the way I looked. And uh, um, so I, I did sort of keep myself to myself, really. Um, so, no, it, it, it gradually happened. I remember moments when I said something spontaneously funny, made a class laugh or made my pals laugh. And, that, and I used to think, you know what, this is this is OK, isn't it, really, to, to get people laughing? Um, I didn't ever think I could make a career out of it, but that's a separate thing, really. But going back to what you're what you're talking about, about the way we hear things, for me, language is music, really. It's a musical. I hear I hear it in rhythm. Um, I was at the comedy store one time. This is probably the best example of the way I hear things. And I asked the guy what he did for a living. And he goes, um, I'm an engineer. And I said, OK, what sort of engineer? And he said, you wouldn't understand. And I said, well, try me. And he said, supersonic gas solutions. And I went, expialidocious, <laughs> right? Just in, just instantly. And I, what I remember is the sort of the, the shock from the room. Whereas for me, it was that is how my head works. It was not, I mean, obviously, I'm, I say it and I hear it for the first time as well. And he got a round of applause. And even the guy, Stan, who used to work in the booth. I remember Stan stores. very well. Yeah, Stan, Yes, yeah, Stan Nelson. Um, Stan, I, even Stan was clapping. And I thought, yeah, that was a good one. But for me, it was rhythm. It's purely, it's musical rhythm, you know. Okay. So that's how I think comics do hear things differently. So to answer your question about whether anyone, you, you asked it basically if anyone can be funny or if anyone can do comedy. Yeah, well, if it, I mean, is everyone funny? Is is really no. the basic? No. Well, I, I no, then no, they're not. They're not. Some people just don't really understand what's going on. I mean, I think I think most people in Britain, interestingly, are funny. I think this is a funny country. I was also going I, to cross over with that, and to, because I, I mean, I uh, I love your book to, to be someone, and uh, absolutely highly recommend it to all our listeners because it's not only funny, but it's very, very touching. 
about sort of a teenage boy learning all kinds of things. Thank but, you. But that I, I'm interested in that rhythmic thing, because obviously in the book, the jam become, you know, the focal point of everything uh, that's good for you and punk and all those things. But the rhythm, isn't there a, a lot of crossover? Because one of my um, best mates who's been on the show is Mark Bedford, Bedders from Madness. And yes. we talk a lot about how why comedians and uh, uh, musicians get on so well. And is it just about the rhythm? Well, I, I mean, look, I... I oh. For me, I, that's how I hear. That's how I hear language. So that's that what that's what works for me. Whether there's a link between the music that I listen to, I mean, I listen to all sorts of music. The jam was really with the jam. It was actually almost more the lyrics, to be honest with you, um, and and the poetry of some of Paul's lyrics. I think is what what connected with me, and the fact that he was talking about politics which he was the first adult that I'd ever heard talk about politics who didn't sound like he was 110, you know? <laughs> he was about five years older than me, and I thought, yes, I, I th this is what I've been waiting for. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, that's an interesting concept, right? and I'm not sure it's the music I listen to. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very into music. I listen to music. I'm going to Glastonbury in a little while. Um, I, I absolutely love going there. I go and see gigs. So music does connect with me, and I know it's not the same for everyone. Um, but in terms of the the rhythm of of speech, I don't know. Did you ever watch The West Wing? Yes, loved it. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely adored The West Wing, and in fact, anything Aaron Sorkin has written, and there is a rhythm to his writing. There is a propulsion, a drive to his writing that I really love, and I think, uh, I, I think that's what I'm talking about, really. Yeah, but but then that rhythm. Has to be there to get it to work with music, doesn't it? Really? Yes, that yes, I I think I think that is true. I I think that is true, and uh, and like I say, I do love my music, and I listen to it all the time. So um, I, I guess that is the case. Yeah, no, I, I'm 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 intrigued to go a little bit deeper into um, the the shyness because um, there's the old adage that performance being the shy person's revenge on the world. Is that you? Well, I don't think of it as revenge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Every night, I get on here, have this, have this, <laughs> and here's another one. It's not. It's not about revenge. No, it's. Listen, I found a way of um, communicating with people, and and also, you know, getting getting those frustrations that I have with the way the world is out in a funny way. Um, I do absolutely love standing there. It is true. I, and and for someone who was like me as a kid, who never really spoke that much to people, to 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 have a job where I speak for a living, it's uh, it's slightly odd to think of it. To be honest with you, because it was because if I'd have if I'd have said to my fourteen year old self, "You're going to be a stand up comedian," I just would have. Well, I would have laughed at them. <laughs> well, so... yeah, but isn't that weird, though? Because, I mean, we know, you know, hundreds of comics and, and everything, and there is a, a, quite a lot of them are intrinsically shy. Uh, yes. But you have to have that bravery in putting yourself out there. I mean, a lot of people who listen to this are obviously not comedians or, or speakers or performers. And the number one fear in the world is public speaking what's having done it what's your best advice to people for overcoming that fear yeah um well i'd say preparedness really i mean just be ready just know what you're going to say and and have a bit, i mean if you know what you're going to say you've got a decent chance of being able to say it well i would suggest um the times when i've when i've felt lost is when i just haven't i don't know what i'm going to say next um, so I would say the more preparation you do, uh, the better, um, after that, it's just flying time. Really. The more you do it, I think the better you get. Um, and I, there was certainly a point about 13 years in when I suddenly something clicked within me and, and now what I call, I call it passionate indifference. Oh. I, I care deeply about what I do, but 
I don't care if you like it, even though I want you to like it. But in the end, you're going to come to me. Do you know what I mean? It's no. you are, you are going to you're going to come into my world. Obviously, I will make allowances if we're in a particular space. If you're doing a corporate gig, you have to let people know where you are and they have to know that, you know, oh, I'm doing a uh, I'm doing a speech to 400 bankers. OK, well, I'll talk about that for a little bit. And once you've done that, once you've earned their trust and they know that you know where you are, you can talk about whatever you want. But I, I, all those gigs, I do prepare. I mean, I'm ready. Well, well isn't that? I mean, it's very interesting because obviously I obviously started at the, the comedy store and did that for a number of years. But now I actually speak at conferences, which is what you do so brilliantly as well and host events and everything. What's the advice for non-comics who want to make it funny for the audience and make the audience feel comfortable uh, as well. I mean, I mean, well, okay. Well, my first question, if I was talking to someone who asked me that, I would say, well, are you funny? <laughs> and in fact, I would probably get a friend of theirs and go, are they funny? <laughs> are they funny? Because if they're not funny, don't try and be funny because it won't work. People can see through that artifice. Um, yeah. What, what would my advice be really? Um, I don't know. I think personal stories work pretty well um, in those situations. It's, it, it really depends on the sort of speaker you are and, and what you're going to be talking about. And if you're going to talk about a very serious subject, don't, don't try and uh, lighten things too much because people aren't, aren't going to want to hear that. Um, but I come back again, know what you're going to say. Be very prepared. Know it backwards. And then maybe you can slip a little bit of humor in there. But don't try too hard. You know, you see a lot of comics, Paul, when they start out, they're trying too hard. They're too much on the front foot, yeah. you know, and, and you need to, to ease off a little bit. My partner, my partner was the one who told me I should do comedy. And she said to me, you know what? you have a moment when you get on stage, have a look at them. They're looking at you. You look at them. Just take a moment. And it took me a long time to learn that lesson. Well, um, it's an inter interesting lesson because um, doing what I do now with psychology, the, one of the things we say in psychology is if you want anyone to go into any state, you have to go into that state first. And one of the first jobs of a comic or a performer is kind of like that sort of supply teacher um, to come in and go, I've got this, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think when you're watching a performer, I, I, for me, I like to watch performers who are enjoying themselves because if they're having a good time and they're really happy in the space, then um, I, I relax. You know, I think we all relax as performers. I mean, Mike Wilmot, who's a Canadian comic, oh, who yeah, I, is an absolutely brilliant Canadian comic. Yeah. He said to me once, he said, the thing is about you, Stoney, no one enjoys your act as much as you. <laughs> 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 because I laugh at my jokes. But the reason I laugh at my jokes is because if I'm telling them properly, I'm essentially hearing them for the first time. Yeah. And there's a delight in one, I hear them. And two, I see people's reaction to them. And I think, isn't this great? So, of course, I'm enjoying it. But not everyone's like that. I no, understand. no, but the master of that, of course, was Billy Connolly, who you mentioned yeah. watching with your dad when you were growing up. You know, yeah, there, he's the master of what, what used to be called laughing it in. Yes, and yes, exactly. And, and, and he was enjoying himself. And I think that that just relaxes you uh, quite a bit. But I mean, I think I think I feel the same in any art form, whether it's dance or whether it's music. When you watch people who really know what they're doing and just love being there, it gives you confidence, doesn't it? And you relax as an audience and then they relax even more as a performer. And it's a symbiotic sort of relationship. But I think that's exactly right. That whole symbiotic thing is. But our first job is to do it. It, it's funny because um, our mutual old friend, colleague, um, Alan Davis, used to break that rule at the start when uh, in his act. Do you remember when he used to just sort of shamble on? Yeah, beautiful. And beautiful. it was just so exquisite, wasn't it? Yeah.
Yeah, well, Alan, Alan is really one of the best comics in the country. I mean, I, I mean, there's not there's not that many people who I think them fun, uh, are funnier than me, but he's a little bit funnier than me, I think. And I genuinely, and I say that I genuinely mean that. And he's he's so quick. But I remember him walking on at the start, having a look at the curtain, yeah. just shambling about a bit. And he used to talk about it like it was the water cooler thing, wasn't it? So the first five minutes you get there, you're standing around the water cooler having a chat. What happened last night? And that was his way of you know, I've just started work. I don't want to get going straight away. I think the line was something like, essentially, I'm doing what you do. I'm uh, I, gone to the uh, toilet, uh, uh, reading the Daily Mirror and having a yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very like. funny. Very funny. And I and I love the way he did that. It was um, dangerous, wasn't it? But, it, it, but, and it? but then he would work the the audience to such a frenzy in the sense of like, oh, God, he's going to be shit. Make them feel awkward. And then say, don't go thinking that I'm, I'm shit. Yes. Yeah. And just yeah. wait. The relief of the tension was uh, masterful, I always thought. That. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, not everyone can do that. No. But he, do, he did it and does it beautifully. And uh, it, it's very impressive. But whatever it is that gives, that gives the audience confidence that you know what you're doing, really. You have to... You have to give people confidence because then they'll relax. I remember, I mean, I compare once in a while, I, I MC the gong show at the comedy store. Oh, yeah. They brought it back. Right. Um, and if people haven't seen the gong show, it's like 35 new acts. And most of them are terrible. <laughs> I mean, terrible. And they get up to five minutes, but they can be booed off beforehand. And, and whoever's the gong meister has a gong and they can hit the gong and off they go. And sometimes they last 15, 20 seconds. It's absolutely hilarious. It's a bear pit, very gladiatorial. And I remember one, um, that I was comparing and the first five had gone within about a minute and a half. I mean, I mean, really it was such a bear pit that evening. And then this guy walked on and he looked pretty relaxed. And I'd told the audience beforehand, let them do their first joke. Let them do the first joke. And he walked on and he said, um, I went to an aquarium the other day and there were signs in Braille. He said, now surely it's not just me who thinks an aquarium is essentially a visual experience. <laughs> And I and I started laughing, and so did everyone else. And everyone else just I could see them all relaxing and going, Oh yeah, this guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. And it was beautiful to watch. He he just chilled the audience out. So that's really the first thing, isn't it? To make sure that people feel comfortable in your company. Well, it it it's funny because I, I used to um uh co-present a, a, a TV show called School of Hard Knocks, where we took a look, group of young unemployed people every year and turned yeah. them into a rugby team in order to teach them the skills. And obviously I didn't teach them rugby. I taught them psychology and, and getting jobs. But um, we had one guy who was the pub funny bloke, big fat bloke, Colin, um, unfortunately no longer with us, but a lovely man. But he absolutely and he goes i want to be a comedian so we were I, I rang don up at the store and said can i bring him down and it was uh, the gong show that he did and, and he came on but he came on and he decided that he was going to dress as a jester all in green and see already your face is no like, why are you doing that there's no you don't need to hammer the point home we know you're a jester you're on stage at a comedy store well, is what i would have said to him yeah well exactly but the the whole point is that he died within two seconds and it made yeah. terrible telly. And so we yeah. took him back again and I actually um, sent him on a, a, a comedy course, which he only did about a couple of days. On. But what he didn't do was remember the material. Yeah. Or or do it. So in a pub, he could be like a, a big fat bloke dancing around. But it's a very different discipline very being different, on stage. Very very, very different. And that's what I'm talking about, being prepared. Remember what you're doing. I used to go through, I used to have it all written down, my stuff. So I'd have five minutes and the jokes would be underlined. If there was any more than three uh, lines of typing between the underlined bits, I'd try and tighten it up a little bit. So I have it word for word and I would learn it and learn it. And I would say it to my partner, double speed. So I knew that I knew it. And even then, Sometimes the pressure of the performing, I would struggle a little bit, but at least I've, I've done my best to try and remember what I'm talking about, you know, 
Because I find it very, very annoying when you see a comic and they go, now, what else? <laughs> and I think, what do you mean, what else? <laughs> Just do, you know, I'm thinking you don't know what you're talking about. So, yeah, prepare. Yeah, it, it's brilliant. Um, I, I want, you mentioned your brilliant book to be someone uh, where you kind of intertwine your personal life with your love of the jam and the that we talked about rhythm but did Paul Weller and the jam influence what you wanted to do in your identity I mean did you learn the guitar and then discover you couldn't play it well enough and then turn to comedy or what what was that <laughs> No, I never had the looks for for a rock star, uh, and I knew that. And I, no, I never tried to play music. We weren't a musical family. We weren't really a reading family, to be honest with you. Um, no, I, with 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 Paul and with the Jam and with the punk thing generally, it was more the attitude um, that, um, I mean, I mean, Paul Weller used to sing. Uh, this is the modern world. And I used to, the lyrics of this is the modern world. What kind of fool do you think I am? You think I know nothing in the modern world. And one of the lines was, I don't give a damn about your review. And I remember hearing that. I'm like, what, 14? And he's 19. And I couldn't believe that someone of 19 would say something yeah. quite so, I kind of care less what you think. Because to be honest, I'm 61 now. I still have trouble. <laughs> not caring about what other people think. I mean, I'm I'm better than I used to be. So I think it was more of an attitude thing, really. Um, and certainly, in terms, it was my first real foray into politics, listening to Paul Weller's lyrics about police brutality and inequality. And and I, I think it, it, it was a political awakening for me. So it was more that than... Oh, I want to be a comedian. I mean, it certainly helped because, and I've heard a number of people say this, that Paul Weller introduced them to all sorts of stuff that they hadn't thought about, poetry, yeah. um, different writers, different musicians. And I think there was that. Uh, but my comedy career was came a bit later, really. I never wanted to be a comic, but um, then I met my partner and things changed. It's it's that apocryphal that she was the one who pushed you up on stage uh, first of all. Um, well, two weeks after we met, and we've been together almost forty years now, wow. me and Rosie. And two weeks after we met, and I was busy staring longingly into her eyes, and she was she thought I was an amiable idiot, but she liked to talk to me. <laughs> and, um, she said to me, and I was an engineer. I was a design engineer. I used to design heating and ventilation and what have you, because I'm good at maths. And then she said to me, you should be a stand-up comedian. And I, I didn't think, oh, I should be a stand-up comedian, but I did think, who is this woman? <laughs> what, what do you see in me? that no one else has seen in me. So that was a, a moment. And then seven years later, I decided to do it. We wrote some jokes and I decided to do it. Um, took me a while because I, I wasn't ready emotionally, I don't think. But um, she saw it early on, that need to entertain. You talked about attitude. Um, obviously, I started earlier than you when the, it was all about attitude basically yes. you know, very little, yes. you know it, it became more professional later on but you, anybody could get up and have a go it was very punk in its early days of the, the comedy store and and all the the scene uh, well i used to go down there paul i used to go down there in 1979 when i was 16 me and my pal simon used to go to the original comedy store yes. In, in Maid Street, in the street. I remember you used to have to get in the lift. In the lift. I remember me and Simon got in the lift with uh, with Rick Mail and Adrian Edmondson. We went up to, went up together. And I so we saw all those acts. And I actually did go on stage when I was 16 because I got called up for the uh, the audience spot because my mate Simon put my name down, the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and I and Tony Allen was a compare and he went, All right, next up. And this is when the audience spot went on uh, the the open spots went on after the show. Yeah, I remember. Like two thirty in the morning. Everyone is so drunk. And, he, and Tony Allen goes, please welcome Ian Stone. And I thought, oh, I've got to go on. So I went on and I said, uh, two lepers walking down the street. How are you? Mustn't crumble. <laughs> and Tony Allen, we hit the gong and went, that's enough of that shit. And I thought, fair enough. 
12 years later, I went back to the comedy store to do my first open spot. And Don said to me, Don Ward is the owner, said to me, you've been here before. And I said, oh, yeah, I come here all the time. I was a punter. He went, no, 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 you've been on stage. And I went, how do you remember that? And he said, the nose. I remember the <laughs> nose. <laughs> so, yeah, I went back. And that was when I, that's when I actually genuinely thought I'll have a go. But yes, essentially, you're right. My, my partner did push me on, but it was a lot of pushing before I actually got on there. Oh, no, no. I, God, I remember. I remember uh, seeing Rick and Aid doing the Dangerous Brothers. Peter Richardson and Nigel Planer yeah. doing uh, 20th Century Coyote. Coyote. And um, Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders when I used to go to the comic strip and Rowan Atkinson. I mean, it was amazing. And I used to, but I never, even then, I never made the leap thinking I could do that. I used to just like watching it. Yeah, well, I mean, it took me years to make the leap because I was kind of a similar age, just going, oh, my God, this is crazy. And it yeah. was a bit mad. But then when it moved to Leicester Square, did you play Leicester Square or did you? Yes, I did Leicester Square. I did it a few times. And it, and I love that room. I think it's a great room. But I think I prefer the new room. Oh, God. The one well, that it's got much now. easier to play the new room in the sense yeah. of that everybody's new, in front of you. Whereas yeah, the old yeah. room, you used to have to, the, the three quarters of the room were to your right. And yes, which yes. Which is not easy uh, no. when you're in a double act, to be honest with you. <laughs> no, not an easy, no, not an easy gig at all. But um, once I started playing it, I was just glad to be part. I mean, it's a great world to be in. So I'm just happy to do it. Oh, God. Well, well, you've seen, and as a professional comedian, what you've talked a bit about the old comedy store, but what makes you laugh now? You know what? I, you sent me a list of questions, and that was, what makes you laugh? That was the number one question. And I wrote, good comedy makes me laugh. Um, it does, and and that's rarer than you think. But good comedy, but not just good. I mean, I well, I'll tell you a story. I took my, um, my grandmother, Sissy, who I think was a bit of an inspiration for my performing career because she wanted to be a dancer, but Jewish girls in the 1920s could not be dancers. My yeah. grandfather forbade it. So she, she, she had a normal life and she, but she was always funny. And um, when my granddad died, she said to me, can you take me to the cemetery? I want to go and visit the grave. I said, sure, sure. Nana, we'll go. But she forgot the grid reference. So we, you know, somebody's buried at G34 yeah, yeah. or whatever. So we're wandering about for about 45 minutes and uh, we can't find it. And she's getting upset and I'm getting a bit irritable. And I said, Nana, is there any, do you have any clues? And she went, oh, he's buried next to the Coens. <laughs> and I went, it's a Jewish cemetery, <laughs> Nana. You're going to have to be more specific than that. And we were crying with laughter. We were, cr we were there in the cemetery just howling. And I'll never forget it. It was so brilliant. People were walking past going, what is going on with those two? That's That makes me laugh. That's funny, right? Yeah, um, that's well, that's genuine funny, isn't it? When it comes from that, that genuine place. It's a beautiful moment. And she, I mean, I mean, even things like she used to phone me up later on in her life and she used to phone up and I go, hello. And she and she'd say to me, it's Nana, I can't speak. I can't speak. And I'd go, what's the point in phoning me if you can't speak? And she'd go, stop it, Ian. But she'd be laughing as well. I used to call her out. And it was, that makes me laugh. Of course, that makes me laugh. As well as, I mean, actually, um, I'll tell you what else makes me laugh. Right now on I, on TikTok, there are, there, there are videos of when babies are crying, people chuck cheese slices and they hit their heads. They sit there on their heads and it stops them crying. <laughs> that makes me laugh as well i know i know i don't get it either well but... all our listeners are desperately going to youtube now and going, going of course and you'll see it and you'll laugh as well it is funny chucking cheese slices on baby's heads to stop them crying and well, it works well uh, oh, hold on I'm, ca I'm calling the social now to be honest with you <laughs> yeah so but good comedy good comedy funny people that's what makes me laugh. Well, really. did you you um, interviewed Jackie Mason uh, a, quite a while ago. Was it was that yeah. kind of like the pinnacle of that? You were talking about Jewish humor and the uh, and those. Was that for you a special moment? 
I, I mean, look, it was a special moment. I'm interviewing Jackie Mason. He's a, I mean, I'm not saying he's a huge hero at the time. I was obviously aware of his work. I went to see him and I love doing it. I love watching him do stand up. I love how, how contained he was. He used to take two steps to the left and two steps to the right. And he'd be doing Jews do this, non Jews do that. Jews do this for two hours. And it was brilliant. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, yeah. Um, I did interview. Jackie and and we had a we had a very interesting chat about comedy and and I, I guess he spent more time on stage than almost anybody on earth him and Ken Dodd yeah. essentially so it was a thrill of course but it was a thrill to to meet Paul Weller after writing the book it was a thrill you said it in the intro I spent five years presenting rock and roll football with Ian Wright yeah you know Arsenal legend and and an icon and uh, he became a mate and 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 that's a thrill that's. That's what I love about the job is you get moments like that uh, where special stuff happens if you just keep working. And it's uh, and, and I never lose that excitement, that sort of child boy, boyish excitement about the whole thing, because, you know, uh, it, life could have gone very differently. Well, no, but I mean, it. everybody says, you know, to uh, Ains and I all talk about this a lot about you know people say aren't you lucky and anything well you go yeah you are but you've worked very hard to get to that place and then I I think well actually I ask you is is humor a superpower that actually bonds people so you can um meet your heroes at the same level rather than just being a fan yeah, I, I think to a certain extent that is true. I remember uh, um, when I started presenting rock and roll football with Wrighty, um, certainly the first few weeks I was sitting there going, oh my God, it's Ian Wright. It's, it's Wrighty sat there. And after a while he was just Wrighty and I'm stony and it became like a friendship. But then what happened was he said to me, we used to present five till seven every Saturday on Absolute Radio, Saturday afternoons. And then I would go and do gigs afterwards. And one... Saturday, just before the end of the show, he said to me, where are you gigging tonight? I said, I'm at the comedy store. He said, oh, come down. And he came to the comedy store and I'm comparing and I ripped it properly. First 10 minutes. And, and I'm not saying it changed that relationship because, you know, we got on great anyway, but he's then seen me do my thing yeah. and thought, yeah, you've got some game as well. So is it a superpower? Um, well, that's not really for me to say, I don't think. But um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad that I can do it. That's what I would say, and it, and it does bond people, no doubt. It really does. Well, I think that's the the, the most important thing. I, I think if you can laugh with somebody, you're automatically on a, a a level. And I was interested that he came to your place of work. You'd been going to his place of work for years. years. Yeah, yeah, and I'd seen him. I'd seen him work and I thought he was one of the best strikers I'd ever seen. I loved him through one-on-one. -on -one. But for him to then, and he knew that I felt that about him. Of course he did. I'm an Arsenal fan. Why would I not feel like that about him? But for him to then see me in the same way that when Paul Weller read the book and I met Paul and he's asking me about comedy and about what it's like to perform as a stand-up, that, it was surreal, but it was... I, I wasn't just a fan. He knew how much I loved him, Paul, because there was a book, a whole book written about him and his influence on me. So for him to see me do my thing as well, that, that's, I, I think those things do matter. Um, well, I think comedy's the great equaliser, to be honest in that, because they, just the fact, A, it's being, you know, the tip of the hat and the chapeau about being good at something, but B, also... If you can laugh together, you are automatically much closer and, and more bonded as a result, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, listen, I've been with my partner for almost 40 years, and the main reason is because we have a laugh, really. I, I heard you yeah. married her for her money, but that's... <laughs> oh, we're not married. Because uh, <laughs> you've, got, you've got to be sure, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, you're going on a national tour soon you know uh, yes details at the instonecomedian.co.uk um yes uh, what advice would you give to people who have to get up to speak for work your work is that but if you've got to speak for work we touched on humor in it 
and I think you're agreeing with me that if you can't do humor, leave it alone. Yeah. But, but a little nugget that people can take away. Well, aside from being prepared, um, try and um, keep it tight. I think really <laughs> keep it tight. I mean, I, I, I genuinely Woody Allen used to do 45 minutes, right? And he felt that was enough. Now I am doing a little bit longer on the tour. I mean, once in a while you'll see someone like Billy Connolly or Jackie Mason who can talk for two and a half hours or Bruce Springsteen plays for three hours. Uh, and you go, yeah, fair enough. You're a genius. That's fair enough. But if you're not a genius, if you're just a good speaker, keep it tight. You know, I mean, what was it? Ivor Dembina, actually, uh, a Jewish comedian. Yes, I know. Many Ivor. years standing. Um, if you're going badly, get off. If you're going well, get off. <laughs> and I think that's pretty good advice. That's really, uh, because actually it's one of those, you were talking about Stam and, of course, the legendary, no longer with us, Kim Kinney who, at the yes. comedy store. Um, and I remember so many nights, especially a Friday late show, when everybody, you know, all the big comics used to just wander around in, in the in the dressing room, go keep it tight, keep it keep tight, it tight. Yes. which was which was you know never good for the Calypso twins, to be honest with you, because Ames's sense of time, <laughs> well, you know, no, that's why they used to put us on last. <laughs> yeah, I, I I do think there is something in that really. I, um, People do ramble on, don't they? And so, if 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 you're watching someone who's who's um, brief, I, I love. There's nothing I love more than brief remarks. Really, I mean, I think all of us tend to go on to a little bit too long, uh, but it's it's finding that pocket where you're in, and going, this is perfect, isn't it? Well, you can sense it, can't you, when you're on stage, and you know when it's going well, but but don't push your luck. You know, oh, they love me. I'll do another 15 minutes. You know what? They love you because you're not going to do another 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is just my opinion. And not everyone is like this. And there are certain performers, Daniel Kitson, one or two others, who are, I can watch for hours. I, can, I genuinely can watch them for hours. Um, but I definitely like coming away from a, a show thinking, oh, I could have had more of that. And that's that's a rare thing. Yeah. So that that if somebody was asking me for one bit of advice about the the about that, I would say, yeah, keep it tight. Yeah. No, I think that that's a great. And if you can't do funny, don't do funny. But I, I will take that a, a level above that, which is, do you think that you can be a great communicator without understanding humor? You can be a good. No, I don't. No, I don't really. I, I think the best ones can do it. I mean, I know politically we don't have too many, do we? Um, and we were talking about Bill Clinton, how good he was, and Obama obviously was very, very good. Um, I think humour is is really. I mean, I, I I was thinking about this. I just think it helps if you can. I think I just think it helps. You can. You can talk about a serious subject. You can still be funny about it. And I think it helps get the message across. Um, I think all the great communicators have been, have had a sense of humor because I, I personally, I think, I think it's a prerequisite for, I mean, I, I don't have any friends who aren't funny. Why would I keep them? Yeah. <laughs> no. Genuinely, why would you want to be with people well, who don't have a sense of humor? Well, I, I completely agree. My friend, Jackie Green, who's like the queen of Broadway PR, I was just over in New York and I, I she has this phrase, which is uh, be smart, be funny or be quiet, which I always think. <laughs> yes. And you know what? There are look, there are smart people who don't really do humor that well, but I sort of sense that they still have it. They just save it because if you're smart, I think, I think it's weird. I would find it weird if somebody was super smart and wasn't funny, actually, maybe some of the computer geeks, but even then, if you've, if yeah. you're, if your brain is switched on, it's switched on for humor as well. Isn't it? Well, I would have thought. I, I think so as well. I mean, you touched on politics and we, we got into that. Paul Weller got you into politics and yes, but, has politics now changed so much that uh, humour and charisma are necessarily necessary to win in politics? And I, I we're recording this at the time where um, 
I think you'll gather that I'm not a fan, but Nigel Farage has just stepped into the race. And, yeah. you know, I can rail against the things, but he does have something about him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a very, very effective communicator. I don't like any of the words he says, no. not a single one. I mean, it's likely that Keir Starmer is going to be our next prime minister. Now, I, I have been doing a joke about how he can't just keep trading on his sheer animal magnetism forever, can he? Right? <laughs> and and it and it does make people laugh. And there is something he doesn't have a lot of charisma, but he, he does have a sense of humour. I know he has a sense of humour. I've seen him be funny. Um, uh, but yeah, politics has changed. I think. Well, the television age has changed it, hasn't it? Really. I mean, I mean, that's we looked at Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson became prime minister really because people found him funny. And have I got news for you? And I thought he was funny. And apparently, when he does corporate gigs, he's excellent because he has this whole sort of bumbling persona. But I tend to think of him more as a comedian than as a politician or as a, someone who should be put be who should be put in charge of anything. To be honest with you. But one can't deny that he was a good communicator. Yeah, no, that's the thing. But I wonder, you know, if that's kind of taken over now. And, you know, the, the big thing I get asked a lot, you know, by um, television newspapers to sort of unpack the body language and the speech patterns of of uh, our leaders and things. And I wonder if, if it's become too much of a thing. Why, why can't competent statesmanlike, you know, be a yeah. thing anymore. And we, we, then we get into Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump got 78 million people to vote for him. Yes. Now, yes. he can't deliver a gag, but he's doing something. He is doing something. It's a very odd thing, though, isn't it, really? Certainly from um, from British eyes. We just, I mean, most of the time it sounds like absolute gobbledygook, um, which I don't think there's been a politician over here who sounded quite like him. You know what, Paul? You're absolutely right. It should be a bit more about the 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 content of their character, as Martin Luther King said. You know, and uh, but we live in a different age now. We've just come off the back of the first TV debate, which is one of the worst things I've ever watched. It was absolutely terrible because they weren't debating; they were just shouting slogans at one another. But that's how a lot of people seem to consume politics nowadays, and and I, I think it's a bit sad. To be honest with you, when you look back, when you look back to the seventies, as much as there was a lot of political unrest, when people used to debate stuff, they used to actually talk about it, um, and there was sort of civil disagreement in the way there isn't now. So I, I'm a little bit despairing, but at the same time, we are going to have a new government, and I'm hopeful that they can't be any better than the last one. But in terms of the communication side of things, um, I think it's worse than. It ever was. That being said, Paul, one of the best communicators in the house, uh, well, in the last 50 years was Enoch Powell. And he was saying terrible things. And before that, by the way, Oswald Mosley apparently was very good. And he was saying terrible things as well. So I'd rather take someone like Keir Starmer, who says better things, but not in a particularly articulate way. Yeah, well, I actually I blame you to be honest with you because me, what you're, have I you're, done? well, you're you're the the new generation who's looking at YouTube and TikTok and watching <laughs> babies cry with with cheese on their heads. No, you're not making them cry with cheese on their head. You're <laughs> stopping them crying. You're doing oh, a service. Okay, well that so that's all right, is it? <laughs> Makes it okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> I think it's always good when babies stop crying. I mean, listen, whatever method works for you. Some people rock them and sing to them, but a lot of people are now cheese slices. <laughs> There's the tip that everybody's going to remember <laughs> from this podcast. Um, Ian, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. We've run, we're running short on time, so we're going to go to quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. <laughs> You work in comedy, maybe comedy, you're thinking comedy is your business, TV is your business, Arsenal is a business, but who is the funniest business person that you've met? You know, I did a, I did a, a corporate gig for the, for the Wood Preservation Society, and I thought it was like a sort of Ron Seal Woodstain type, you know, but it was actually preserving woodlands, which I didn't know until I got there, which was quite funny. And I met this guy there uh, called uh, Barry Coggins, 
uh, who was a doctor. I said, you're called Dr. Coggins. And he said, yes. I said, if I ever write a children's story set in 1892, I'm having a character called Dr. Coggins. But he was really nice to me and he was very funny. So he was probably the funniest business person. What book makes you laugh? Um, well, there's passages um, from a Bill Bryson book about Australia when he does a two-page, um, basically a piss take of cricket commentary on the radio. And the language he uses makes me cry with laughter. Just, just mocking gently the uh, uh, test match special cricket commentary, which I love, by the way. I absolutely, I will have it on on in the background all day through the summer when uh, when England are playing test matches. And, um, you know, and now Andy Zaltzman, a friend of ours, is on there. Yes. He's on there now as the stat uh, statistician. But Bill Bryson wrote a two-page uh, piss take of test match special that was so funny and in terms of actual books confederacy of dunces oh which, what a book yeah which is john kennedy tool oh tool isn't it or tool yeah. i think i i was it was given to me i read it and i thought wow this is incredible incredible book we've had the lovely ebony rainford brent who um is a mate of mine as well who yeah. from test match special so i'm hoping bill bryson didn't take the piss out of her I, I, no, I, no, I'm there sorry. was just some, it was something about the tone of the, the, the writing, just so spot on. I show it to a lot of people. Oh, can I do another one as well? Yeah. Uh, Clive James, um, when he used to do his TV criticism back in the 70s and early 80s, and, and, I, and I remember reading various ones, various reviews from the paper, and it was all in, he, he had them put into a book. Some of those got me in tears of laughter. Just the language beautiful so no, well, it's it comes back to language isn't it and the love of language yeah what film makes you laugh in dirty rotten scoundrels michael Caine and um yes and um steve martin steve and steve martin absolutely brilliant they played it so brilliantly um midnight run i love midnight run i, I mean it's not it's not all funny there are some very poignant and sweet moments but i just think I just think it's it's played so perfectly. Um, Is it funny? Because the, the, the two Arsenal fans, Ainsley and you, both chose Midnight Run. Comics often, it's a comics film. Yeah. Comics really love that movie. There's something perfectly pitched about it. And I think Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is the same. Um, I mean, there's loads of films, certain Woody Allen uh, uh, films. Um, Airplane, Life of Brian. I mean, there's loads of them. Yeah, <laughs> I could, I feel that you could go on for quite a while. With I could, those. I could. I'll stop that one. <laughs> what word makes you laugh? Ablutions. <laughs> it's, a word. it's a funny word. It's a funny word. It's partly because of what it is as well, you know, but it's ablutions makes me laugh. <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's a great word. Um, <laughs> taking a shift to the other side. Yeah. What's not funny? Uh, I mean, I don't really, I don't really accept the premise of this question. If I'm honest with okay. you, I think everything can have funny aspects. You know, I just told you a story about being in a graveyard and not being able to find my dad, my granddad's grave, and we're laughing. Um, I mean, what's not funny? The death of a loved one is not in itself funny. My dog died the other week, Alfie, and uh, it wasn't. It's not funny in any way. It was just sad. Um, but even then. You can you then find humour in in things around the situation. So so now everything can have funny aspects, but yeah, death of a loved one is just grim. And so you know, but, but is that not tragedy plus time? Then then you can laugh at it because but, but I I was just thinking um, when my father died eight years ago and uh, we went for the memorial in Hungary. And I walked into a room with my brother and his wife and their kids and everything. And it was very, very somber. And he died when he was 89. And we planned this big 90th birthday thing. And I just walked in and I had not planned, as you know, these things. And I went selfish bastard. Yeah, beautiful. And people, are, that's funny, but it's not, that is, yeah, but that's funny about, about the party and about him being selfish by dying as opposed to the actual 
the moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a slightly different thing. Well, yeah, but it, um, it got the reaction of the sharp intake of breaths yeah, and of then the guffaw uh, yeah. with the release. Yes. And I and listen, I've been to funerals. I've been to plenty of funerals where people have laughed. So, it, it, it you know, Malcolm Hardy died and they wheeled out his coffin and they played Return to Sender. And, I mean, everybody pissed themselves <laughs> laughing. And, I mean, why would you not? That's really funny. And at the same time, there's our mate in the coffin. So I I, I don't, that conversation, people say, oh, there anything you shouldn't do jokes about. And I just think, no, no, there is absolutely nothing that I would avoid. Genuinely nothing. No, no, I, I think it's right. It's I'm just the you. way you do it, isn't it? It's the way it's the, I suppose it's about, the, if is it done with eff affection? Is it done at the right time? Is it done with the right people? I mean, look, I, I know this is getting slightly off the subject. People do get offended by by comedy on occasion. We know that. Um, I remember when um, when uh, Princess Diana, remember they had the Memorial Fountain in Kensington? Yeah. And I said it was a fitting tribute because it was shallow and it kept breaking down, right? And now, now I couldn't have done that joke on the day or the week that she died because people were in a bit of a state even though I found it weird, but you know what? That's how it was. Um, but this was a couple of years later. Even a couple of years later, people were going, Ooh. Too soon. <laughs> too soon, is it? <laughs> Whereas, of course, it's not too soon. Of course. But that's what I mean. There is nothing that is intrinsically not funny. Um, but there are loads of things that are not funny as well. Yeah, Sorry. Well, but by the way, isn't it the, the comic's job or the jester's job to to find the line and go over it because you don't know where the line is. But, yes, but I wouldn't do it dressed as a jester. Is my <laughs> is my point. If you're listening, mate. Oh no, he died, didn't yeah, he? Oh well, well I could have told him. <laughs> yes, oh, I tried oh, to tell him. That really upsets me. There, anyway. <laughs> I know it's an image and everything. I'll send you the clip one day. It was oh, that terrible. Um, what sound makes you laugh, Ian? <laughs> A cheese slice <laughs> hitting a baby's head. <laughs> Honestly, there's a sort of slap to it. it I cannot, you've really got to watch them. <laughs> oh, anyway. Oh, but ladies and gentlemen, that was the ultimate callback. <laughs> yeah, people, like, audiences like that. Yeah. Cheese slice hitting a baby's head does make me laugh. Um, Yeah. What? Uh, yeah, certain squelches can be quite funny, I think. Squelch, I think. A squelch, I think a, a, a some absorption in whatever something's hitting something else. If there's a bit of absorption and a sort of squelch, that would make me laugh more than just a boof straight off. Oh. That's my point about that. I can't get that out of my head now. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, penultimate question. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Well, I mean, I'm going to say funny because I love, love the fact that people do laugh at my stuff. But in another life, I do think that I could have been Toby Ziegler from the West Wing, <laughs> sort of intense yeah. Jew with, you know, with a clever, just clever and politically motivated. I, I, there was a bit of me and he was funny as well, by the way. But um, I'll take funny. I'll take funny. Well, yeah. uh, frankly, I don't think you can... Uh, be funny without being clever i think oh. there's there's a brain way the brain works and has to compute so many things so quickly i think it, it you have to be clever as well so i'll give you both all right i'll take that a, a bonus um, Thank you. and finally desert island gags yeah and only take one joke with you to a desert island ian what is it you know what? You didn't specify whether I'd written it or someone else had written it. No. You don't really mind, do don't you? Mind. I mean, the best joke I wrote um, was the the, uh, the Chinese are listening to our phone calls. Are they? I couldn't give a shit. Most of my phone calls just order in Chinese. <laughs> That's the best gag I think I've ever written, <laughs> right? Great gag. And 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 I I don't know. I suppose. I suppose I could take that with me just as a, a, do you know what? 
can I sort of, sorry, I love that joke, and that's a joke I've written. The best ad lib was supersonic gas solutions and our uh, expialidocious. Yeah. Can I take can I take that instead? Because that's a purer moment. Is that all right? Okay. I'm only I'm only allowed one, right? Uh, you're only allowed one, but I, I think the pure moment and and the response uh is what wins uh in that gag as well. You write jokes and a lot of people listen and they go, oh, that's a great joke. And I've seen it and it's got loads of like millions of hits on on uh, TikTok and Instagram, that joke. Right. Because it, it has a certain rhythm to it. Brilliant. Um, but in terms of just pure comedy where. You know, it, it happens in the moment, I, I, I think that's what I'd like to take with me, because that's 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 the magic of it. Right. Yeah. Well, well it is magic. And you have been magical in your stories you've taught us a lot um especially about how to <laughs> cheer a baby up with a cheese slice <laughs> you're gonna all watch it now aren't you? Gonna <laughs> we're all, all watch. gonna watch it ian stone <laughs> thank you so much for being a brilliant guest on the humorology thanks podcast. paul thank you absolute pleasure the humorology podcast was hosted by paul barros produced by david rose Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.